begin our discussion on membrane transport. In the previous two lectures, we have looked at membrane proteins, how they are embedded in the membrane, and the different types that are possible. What we will do in this lecture is, in the two lectures, is look at the types of transport proteins, what we mean by membrane potential, and look at passive transport in this lecture. And in the next lecture, we will look at active transport and discuss a few problems. What we have as transporters, channels, iron of force, porins, iron channels, these are what mediate channel transport, membrane transport, and are extremely important in the passage of nutrients and ions through the cell membrane. If we revisit the cell membrane, we looked at the composition of the phospholipid bilayer and found out there were the specific types of proteins that were required for the transport of material from the external extracellular fluid to the cytoplasm. And these were either integral proteins that could allow a transfer. These transfer proteins could be an alpha helix type or a beta sheet type that looked at that formed a beta barrel, like in the porin proteins, or we found a beta helix type that was there to accommodate the specific transportation of ions. The presence of cholesterol in these membranes gives a relative fluidity to the membrane that is required for the motion and for a geometric conformational change that is going to be required for the ion transport or the transport across the membrane. When we look at this regular membrane, if we look at the responses of an animal cell to changes in osmolarity, if we have a normal isotonic solution, there is the transfer of water in and out of the system of the cell. However, in a hypertonic situation, the water is going to be extracted out of the cell, which will result in a shriveled cell. In the opposite case, where we have a hypotonic solution, then there will be water that would enter the cell and finally lead to its rupture. So the condition that the transfer of water is perfected based on the membrane quality is important here. So we look at the concept of membrane permeability. When we look at membrane permeability, we understand that this is our lipid bilayer. We can have small polar molecules that would be permeable to the membrane. There could be uncharged polar molecules that may or may not pass through the membrane. However, there could be very large polar molecules, other ions and charged polar molecules that would be impermeable to the membrane. However, their transfer can, can be affected by specific transporter proteins and specific types of functions that would bring about the process of the transfer from the extracellular material to the inside of the cell and from the inside of the cell to the outside. The importance of membrane transport, therefore, occurs because the cells need to import hydrophilic nutrients and molecules for the functioning, for the specific health of the cell to maintain all the biochemical processes, the functions that go on into the cell. They also need to eliminate waste products. They need to regulate ion concentrations. These ions are needed for specific reactions that go on in the cell. Then they also need to selectively permit the entry and exit of specific ions or polar molecules. For example, there may be a channel that allows the transport of sodium but not potassium or glucose only and not fructose. So this selectivity is very important for the maintenance of the cell. In the mechanism of transport through the cell membrane, therefore, it is possible that there is passive transport where there is no extra energy required to bring about this transfer. It is a spontaneous process and commonly a bidirectional process. Active transport, on the other hand, is an against an electrochemical gradient. 
and it requires energy for transportation. We will see what we mean by this chemical and electrochemical gradient as we go on through the lectures. Now, the degree of order, fluidity, and curvature, we looked at how the curvature can change in a lipid bilayer based on the size of the head group and the length of the fatty acid chains. So the size and shape of the lipid head group and the length of the tail was important to describe the fluidity of the membrane, which eventually led to the curvature to the different leaflets that were part of the membrane. If we look at the polarity of the membrane now, so we have this, we have the, either the curvature this way or this way, depending upon the type and size of the lipid head group and the length of the tail. The polarity on the other hand evolves because there are more cations that are expelled or removed from the cell than accepted. So if there are more cations that are expelled, what happens is the cytoplasmic side is slightly negative compared to the exoplasmic side. So if the cations are selectively removed from the cell, if this is the inner part of the cell and this are cell membrane, then eventually what happens, there is a negative charge in the cytoplasmic region compared to the outside, which is slightly positive in nature. This does not, 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 not mean that it actually disrupts the electron neutrality in the sense, but this positive and this, po this positive and this negative are relatively close together in the membrane, but because of the expulsion of the cations more than they are accepted in the cell, this is slightly negative in nature. So here we have our cell, we have our lipid bilayer, if we have our membrane that could be say a helical type or we could have a porin type and on the outside we have positive charges, on the inside we have relatively more negative charges. So in the transport proteins there would be channels and there would be transporters that affect the transportation of nutrients in either direction of the cell membrane. So when we are looking at passive transport of small molecules, water or ions, we can have gated channels. These gated channels or these gates open when they are triggered by pH, by voltage or by small molecules. Similarly, if we look at transporters, this allows the passive or active transport of solutes. Transportation of larger molecules are possible and these are usually gated and there are small molecules that trigger the gates. So the types of plasma membrane ion channels that are possible are passive channels. These are always open in the diffusion possible for smaller molecules. There can be chemically gated channels which open with say the binding of a specific molecule, for example, a neurotransmitter. There can be voltage-gated channels that open and close in response to membrane potential. The changes in membrane potential may come across when there are ion transports, cation and anion transports that can, could lead to a disruption in the membrane potential. Then there are mechanically-gated channels that open and close due to conformational change of receptors that is possible again due to small molecule or large molecule binding in or outside the specific protein that forms the transport protein. For the membrane potential, if we try and understand what we mean by a resting membrane potential, we saw the lipid bilayer. So these are the two leaflets that we have. At, on the outside level, we saw there were more positive positive ions and inside there were relatively more negative ions because of the expulsion of cations preferably from the inside of the cell. Under resting conditions therefore cells would generate an electrical potential difference across the plasma mem membrane because the inside of the cell is negatively charged with respect to the outside. This is called the resting membrane potential and this exists because of 
the disbalance of charges across the plasma membrane. The resting potential therefore exists because ions are concentrated on different sides of the membrane and for example we could have Na plus and Cl minus outside the cell and K plus and organic ions gener generally written as A minus inside the cell. So this difference in the charges across the cell membrane gives us what is called a resting membrane potential. This magnitude depends upon the type of the cell and it usually ranges between minus 60 and minus 90 and the negative charge is because we have the excess charge on the inside because the polarity, the positive or the negative of the membrane potential is in terms of the sign of the excess charge on the inside. So this is the way it is represented by convention that the polarity, whether it's positive or negative, of the membrane potential is in terms of the sign of the excess charge on the inside. And this, as we saw, is usually negative and the value ranges from around minus 60 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts. Now, the resting chemical um, membrane potential is therefore determined by the differences in ion concentrations of the intracellular and extracellular fluids as can be understood and also to the permeability of the plasma membrane to the different ions which is important in bringing about this potential across the membranes. So the resting membrane potential would depend upon the differences that arise due to the differences in ion concentration in the intracellular and extracellular fluids and to the permeability of the plasma membrane to the specific ions. So the transmembrane movement of ions can therefore be accomplished. It depends upon, therefore, the charge difference across the membrane. This generates what is called an electrochemical potential, which we will revisit in the lecture, next lecture that also will deal with membrane transport. What we have here is we have an electrochemical potential inside the cell and outside the cell. The difference between the inside, the voltage difference between the inside and the outside of the cell is given by this psi n minus psi f, that is the delta psi. This is our membrane potential. And this will change depending upon the ions that are present inside and the ions that are present outside and their transfer. If we look at now the transfer in terms of what we call passive transport, this is thermodynamically favorable. We will be looking at the thermodynamics of membrane transport in the next lecture where we will see the presence or see how we can accomplish the value or how we can determine the value of delta G given the concentration of ions inside and outside the cell. The factors that are important in this case are the concentration gradients. So we would want to know the concentration of ions inside the cell and the concentration of the same ions outside the cell to determine a delta G associated with this. The hydrophobicity of the specific membrane, the size, charge and temperature are other properties that are important. There could be simple diffusion across the membrane or there could be passive mediated transport where, where there will be proteins that would assist the transport of the material from one side of the cell to the other through the plasma membrane. In the case of simple diffusion, where we are looking at just oxygen and carbon dioxide transfer from the transport through the plasma membrane, this is driven by a chemical potential gradient and it does not occur against any concentration gradient. So if we have our membrane and we are looking at the transport of the small molecules 
oxygen and carbon dioxide in a simple diffusion method we would just have this pass through the membrane we can have selectivity in some cases bacterial pores can be weakly selective on the other hand we can have eukaryotic channels that can be highly selective as we will see later on specific to ions in passive mediated transport substances that are too large or too polar to just diffuse across the bilayer are transported by proteins these proteins are carriers permeases channels and transporters and they assist in the transport of the material specific molecules across the membrane they can be ionophores the carriers can be ionophores they can be porins they can be specific ion channels they can be aquaporins and as the name implies the transport of water through the membrane and specific transport proteins the passive transport can occur through channel forming ionophores in this case there are transmembrane channels formed and if we look at a specific example of gramicidin a this is this transfers around 10 to the 7 k plus ions per second and this is the way it does the transfer where there is a channel forming ionophore so the transfer occurs in this way when we look at a carrier ionophore it makes ions soluble in the membrane for example in valinomycin and it allows the transfer in this fashion and if we look at the gramicidin in, in case of uh, valinomycin this is the transfer rate if we look at the structures of these specific types of proteins gramicidin a and valinomycin we will see that they are quite small gramicidin is a 15 residue linear peptide it is a non ribosomal peptide composed of alternating d and l amino acids that are all hydrophobic in nature as would be expected this being the channel that it is as we saw in the last lecture we would have likely all hydrophobic amino acids on the surface of this helix it dimerizes head to head to form a channel through the membrane and it functions as an ion channel type of an ion if we look at valinomycin this is one of the best characterized ionophores it binds the k plus ions it is a cyclic peptide that creates this channel that transports between transports the specific ions and the the cavity here is very specific and it can discriminate between sodium and potassium so if we look at the types of transportations possible where we have our cell membrane we have a cytoplasmic region and we have our external region we can have simple diffusion we can have an aquaporin that will transport the water we can have a glucose transport mediated by the carrier protein which we will see in a moment and we could have active transport which we will look at in the next lecture so this looks at all the different possibilities that are there for the transport through the membrane if we now look at the specific active transport type we will see that we will have atp come into the scene there where we have an atp contain this energy requirement is there for active transport the transport protein channels therefore there are specific type of channels that have a transmembrane domain which could be specific for an ion such as the k plus channel or we could have an aquaporin channel that would be specific for the transport of water so if we look at these ion channels all of these organisms have channels for sodium potassium chloride ions and the membrane transport of these ions is very important to maintain the osmotic balance to for signal transduction and for the specific membrane potential to maintain the resting membrane potential of the membrane the channels that are these transport proteins for example we have a helical bundle fold as this is called this being the transmembrane domain we also have a cytoplasmic domain in this specific example of the k plus channel where we have the exoplasm and the cytoplasm here 
when we look at this K plus channel, a very interesting protein, we have its structural aspects with the specific helices where we have an outer helix and we have an inner helix. In this case, this is an integral membrane protein, a multi-helical protein. It is a homotetramer. It has 158 residues and has the capacity to transfer 10 to the 8 ions per second. And the selectivity filter that is here in the center of the protein or center of the channel allows the passage of K plus only and not Na plus. It works in a very interesting fashion where the inner pore is highlight has small polar OH residues the residues that contain OH, that is serine, threonine among them, that would hold on to the dehydrated K plus as it goes through, but not Na plus because that is not energetically favorable for it. So when it brings about this K plus ion, we will see a larger concentration of K plus inside the cell than the outside of the cell. Now these ion channels are gated in the sense that they are closed and open upon specific signals. As we saw, these signals can be mechanosensitive in nature that responds to membrane deformation, touch, sound, or osmotic pressure. They could be ligand gated. They open in response to, say, a neurotransmitter, or they could be signal gated. They open on the intracellular binding of, say, calcium, and voltage gated that could open in response to a change in the membrane potential, which would, is involved in transmission of nerve impulses. If we look at an example of a ligand gated channel opening in response to an extracellular chemical stimulus, we can look at the example of a neurotransmitter binding. So this is our neurotransmitter, a small ligand molecule that would bind to the specific site associated on the transmembrane protein for it. Once this binds, then this, these molecules are not able to transfer through to the membrane, but on binding, this opens up the gate and allows the transfer through the gate. So this transfer is a ligand gated channel that opens up only when the ligand is bound to the transmembrane helical protein. So the gated channels, we have the channels open. The ions, therefore, can move along chemical gradients and the diffusion, the diffusion process will occur from a high concentration to a low concentration. The ions can also move along electrical gradients and as would be expected, they would move towards the opposite charge. Then we can have an electrochemical gradient due to the voltage change across the membrane. Aquaporins are such one such examples that allow the rapid rates of water transport through the membrane. Another type of examples are mediated transporters. Where we have mediated transporters, there are three types of mediated transporters. There are unipot type, sympot type, and antipot type. And this again is involved in the transportation of nutrients, ions, and so when we look at transport proteins, we have a uniport that is facilitated diffusion where we have the membrane and we have facilitated diffusion through the membrane. We can have a sympot type that is has co-transport where there is the transport against a gradient by displacing one or more of the ions and the molecules move in the same direction. In the antipod type, there is an exchange diffusion and the molecules move in opposite direction. So we have one moving inside and the other moving outside. In a unipod example of transport proteins, we will look at the glucose binding protein, the GLUT1 protein, that is an erythrocyte glucose transporter. This is the lipid bilayer and we have this specific protein embedded here. When binds, there is a specific glucose binding site and there is a transformation from the outside to the inside where there would be the possibility of the transfer from the 
outside to the inside. So in this case, we see this portion closed. It can also intermediate where we have the top portion closed. So glucose can enter through the top where we would have glucose binding in this fashion or once it enters, then this can close. This region would open. Glucose would be discharged to the other side of the membrane and it would be transported through. So we have these glucose binding sites on both sides of the membrane and this is facilitated diffusion. Another such example is called the sweets family. That is sugars will eventually be exported transporters. So this is the type that they work with. There is a specific extracellular and intracellular gate that opens and closes. So we can have the closing of the gate at one point and we have the outward opening gate at the other point and on substrate binding, this is facilitated in the specific type of sugar transporters. So as the name implies, these transport sugars. So the process is that there is an outward open state where the inner side is blocked by a cluster of aromatic and non-polar residues by the intracellular grid. The substrate binding induces a specific motion of the outward open state to the inward open state. So from the outward open, outward open state, it moves to an inward open state. And then the outward closed state where this is blocked by the extracellular gate. So whatever transportation is possible, the sugar is bound, substrate is bound, and then it is transferred across the membrane. If we look at the kinetics of the simple diffusion and mediated transport, where we're looking at the rate of diffusion, a simple diffusion or a mediated transport would follow a different type of pattern. A mediated transport would follow a hyperbolic transport, where we are hyperbolic type fashion, where we are facilitating this. And this would be a simple transport in a linear fashion. So the assistance due to the mediated mediator that is the protein here allows for a better rate of diffusion across the membrane that is facilitated by the protein. If we look at the porins, the outer membrane porin F, this is also a membrane spanning protein with a beta barrel structure with a central aqueous channel and it has little substrate selectivity in that sense. So this is a trimeric integral membrane protein that is again responsible for the passive transport of small hydrophilic molecules through the specific pores that are available due to the beta barrel structure. In active transport, which we will visit in the next lecture, it requires energy, ATP, to transport the subst substance, whatever small polar molecules or whatever ions from the inside or outside of the membrane and this transport substances against a concentration gradient. So what we looked at in this lecture was the general application of the membrane structure and how we can have the different types of transport proteins. These transport proteins are going to assist in the transport of nutrients small polar, large polar molecules across the cellular membrane. We can have the passive transport or the active transport. We looked at passive transport where we can have normal diffusion, simple diffusion, or we can have mediated diffusion depending on the type of membrane present, membrane protein present that would facilitate the transport from one side to the other of the plasma membrane. We also understood that there is a membrane potential involved and we will look at the membrane potential in a bit more detail to understand the thermodynamics of the membrane transport, thermodynamics of the transfer of material from one side of the membrane to the other. These are the references.